Good afternoon and welcome to the Commemorative Air Force Wednesday webinar series. I'm Nancy McGee and I'm the Vice President of Education. And today we're here to talk all about air shows. And boy, do we have some experts here with us to talk about air shows. Um, I'd like to introduce, first of all, John Cudahy, who is the ICAST, the International Council of Air Shows President and CEO. John has for more than two decades directed and overseen all of the strategic and operational aspects of the air show industry's largest trade show. During that time, John has led and managed the association through multiple periods of growth and challenge that established standards and best practices of improved safety, overcome significant legislation and regulatory threats to the industry, resulting in great growth and stabilization for both the association and the industry that it represents. And also with us today is Adam Glowowski. He joined the ICAST staff in 2020 as the Director of Marketing and Communications. He's worked within the air show industry over for over the past decade, supporting various business marketing needs. He's a graduate of Iowa State University, and Adam is also a multi-engine rated commercial pilot, and he lives in Northern Iowa. Is it cold there today, Adam? Uh, yeah, it's a little chilly today. We've got uh, some nice light misty rain and 45 degrees, so yeah, it definitely does not feel like late summer, early fall. No kidding. It's crazy world. And John, where do I find you today? I am in Leesburg, Virginia, which is the headquarters office of ICAST. It's about uh, 30 miles west of Washington, D.C., but well outside the Beltway. Okay, beautiful area. Well, let's jump into ICAST and all about air shows. So first of all, what is ICAST, and, and especially in terms of preserving air shows? Um, ICAST is a trade association. It, it, it differs a little bit from the CAF, which I believe is a 501c3. We are what's called a 501c6, and that gives us the ability to do, among other things, um, lobby on behalf of the airshow industry. But we are a nonprofit. We were formed in 1967 uh, around the issues of safety, um, uh, economics, how to, how to get the jet teams to pay for their own fuel, and insurance was a big issue at the time. Since then, we've gotten to, that, that was an organization that started with five or six members literally sitting around a, a coffee table in, at a Milwaukee, Wisconsin uh, hotel. Since then, we, we have increased in size to between 800 and 900, depending on when, when you ask the question. And uh, we are best known probably for our convention, which we held, hold each year in Las Vegas, Nevada. We uh, attract between 1,500 and 1,600 people each year. But in addition to that, we do a lot of lobbying. We uh, develop safety standards. We work closely with the FAA to ensure the competence of airshow pilots who fly aerobatics. We run a number of other safety programs and generally we help to facilitate the exchange of information between our members. There is not a uh, uh, sort of college level discipline, obviously, in the air show business. And so our members hold the body of knowledge that is air shows and they pass that from each other, among each other. And, and we are probably the best method for doing that between our meetings, our publications, our website and other programs like that. Great, thank you. So let's talk about air show industry and, and performers. What kind of people does ICAST represent in the aircraft air show industry? Well, within the air show industry, Nancy, um, ICAST represents, we basically divide it into three main categories, the performers, uh, the event organizers, and support service providers. Um, within the membership, uh, it's about evenly divided between one third, one third, and one third of our members are in, in about each category. Uh, from that from that standpoint, um, the ICAS itself does not really have any audience or spectators as members. Um, but much of what we do and what we talk about and what we what we deal with revolves around them, considering they are the the lifeblood of of air shows in general. Without without fans, without spectators, um, air shows would would not exist. So um, from that standpoint, in a typical year um, for us. 
uh, and, and 2020 is definitely not a typical year. Uh, between 10 and 12 million people attend air shows in, in North America, so the U.S. and Canada. Um, so obviously there's a, a fair amount of, of people that, that experience air shows and that air shows touch um, across the country and, and across North America and, and around the world, of course, as well. Um, so from our, from our standpoint, our representation works within those, those three main categories, the performers, event organizers, support service providers, um, and we work to help them um, in their individual ways from a performer standpoint. Um, we work on the safety aspect uh, from, from getting uh, aerobatic competency, competent, excuse me, competency cards um, and able to be able to fly in air shows. Uh, we assist event organizers with uh, specifics um, from safety standpoints to um, any other uh, pieces that they may need helping to, to share knowledge. And that's especially important in 2020, um, making sure that knowledge is being shared across across the entire industry because there are so many new things that we are learning each and every day and, and how to deal and, and work through what we're currently going through. Um, and then support service providers as well are a key uh, component of the industry and they include everything from um, people, from tickets, ticketing, uh, from parking, uh, to smoke oil, to, um, I mean, it, to, sales of t-shirts and, and hats and, and food and vendors and things like that. So um, it's, a, it's a pretty broad uh, component of that, that builds this industry, but uh, it, it helps makes us strong. Well, and I have to say as an ICAST member, I have to tell you guys, you are great communicators and I love how well you are, are the purveyors of the tribal knowledge and pass that along, you know, and kudos to you guys for all that you've done, especially in this COVID world that we're now in. I get emails from you all the time with great suggestions on how to move forward. Well, let's talk a little bit about air shows because your numbers of how many people attend air shows is, is pretty staggering. So tell us why air shows, what is the appeal? You know, it's, uh I, I learned early in my tenure with ICAST that uh, somebody said people are as fascinated with flight now as they were in, in 1903, shortly after the Wright brothers um, started to fly, uh, had their first flight. And and I have kind of paid attention to that during my 20 years with ICAST. It, it's true. You, you go to a show and uh, kids are having a good time. Parents are enjoying themselves. Uh, it is It is probably in my opinion, the world's most unique form of entertainment. And there's nothing really like it. I mean, if you go to a basketball game or a hockey game, you're, you're obviously basketball and hockey fans don't feel this way, but they're kind of the same thing. Hot, football, college football, professional football, even concerts are kind of similar. But when you go to an air show, you see an assembly of assets that you can't see anywhere else. The, the closest thing I've come to uh, uh, as a comparison is Cirque du Soleil. Cir Cirque du Soleil has a, a kind of entertainment, if you've ever been to one of their shows, that's really unlike anything else. You know, they call themselves a circus, but they're not really a circus. They're hard to describe. And that is kind of what air shows are about. You can't go really anywhere else but an air show to see aerobatics and airplanes or to, to, to see sort of a six ship military team, e each pilot flying a 30 or $40 million airplane. It, it's that unique. And I think that's why good years, bad years, sequestration, uh, to some extent, even during COVID, people come out to see us because it, it is that interesting. And, and part of the reason it's interesting is because it's inspiring. Uh, I, I have lost count of the number of people who have approached me as adults to say that they went to a show when they were six or seven or nine years old. Uh, and it, and it, and it put them on a path to a career in aviation. I, I learned to fly shortly after I came to work at ICAS, and my flight instructor was a young man, 18, 19 years old. And, and as anybody who's learned to fly knows, you spend a lot of time with your first flight instructor. And over time, I found out that when he was six years old, he, um, he went to an air show near, near uh, Washington, D.C. at Andrews Air Force Base, and he had not been there 20 minutes as a six-year-old boy and he told his father, I am going to make a career out of this. I can't. I, I, I don't know that I knew how to 
change my own clothes when I was six years old, much less decide on a career. But he did that, and uh, that I got my license 15, 16, 17 years ago, and I know that he is now a charter pilot. He's still an instructor, and he makes his living in aviation. And, and I say that not because it's a remarkable story, but because it's so common. When I talk to military people, especially m many of them uh, got their first interest in aviation when they went to an air show. Uh, I went to my first air show uh, by completely by coincidence uh, 46 years ago yesterday uh, at a place called Naval Air Station South Weymouth in Massachusetts. And I went because I had an interest in warbirds and I had never seen a warbird before other than in books or magazines. And I went out there and I can remember it like it was yesterday. I saw a P-47, I saw a Mustang, I saw the Blue Angels, and I met or heard over the PA system, a whole bunch of people who I have subsequently worked with for years and years and years. I was a 12 year old boy at the time. And, uh, and that left an indelible impression on me that really has driven, I, I did not have a career in aviation in the intervening years, but when it, when this job opened up and I came to it, it was my, it was my one visit to an air show many years before that, that got me interested in the job and has kept me uh, in this job for so many years. I bet you could tell a thousand stories like that. That's great, John. Well, let's talk about the history of air shows. How did they get started? What, you know, it's not exactly your typical show. So tell us more about those. Well, about six years after the Wright brothers um, had their first flight, there's actually, depending on who you talk to, the there's a show in France in 1909 um, that was kind of the first air show in the world. Uh, the first one in, in the United States was shortly thereafter in mid-January of 1910, um, which is a, a pretty amazing feat considering we had just learned how to fly, uh, well, essentially six years prior. But um, some of the some of the advances that we made in, in the history of air shows is, is kind of the military air show, which stemmed somewhat off of uh, World War I. Uh, pilots that were after World War One were looking for something to do. They needed to keep their skills sharp, um, and so they kind of got into doing doing things that uh, helped them to be better pilots. And and that kind of turned into a military air show, which kind of which pushed us into the barnstormer age of of the 1920s, uh, which kind of helped actually helped to give way to commercial aviation because it built awareness of aviation kind of on a broader scale. Uh, and that helped to uh, that also helped to bring air shows to the masses because instead of just at airports uh, like the military air shows were, they actually they did air shows at at fairs and festivals and places where there there were no runways. Um, but that was that was part of the uniqueness uh, that air shows brought. And and I mean it was such a novelty back then just to see an airplane fly, much less somebody uh, crawling out on a wing or or doing a, a loop or a barrel roll, et cetera. Um, into the 1930s, uh, air races kind of helped us help the country a little bit through the Great Depression. Uh, newspapers brought updates of, of air races and what was going on there. Um, and unfortunately, as we kind of went through, uh, there were some aviation accidents that happened, but that kind of helped us to get to where we are now from a safety standpoint. Um, and we, we learned and we built and we, we created ways to um, be better and do better um, from a from a safety standpoint and just from a from a unique standpoint. Um, I mean, especially after World War II, uh, which obviously people in the CAF are very aware of, um, air shows became a little bit less of a novelty simply because aviation was so mainstream. Um, commercial aviation was such a a key player in the world, and, and people understood the uh, the aviation and aircraft and <laughs> air power and the importance of that just in, in general life. And so uh, it, it changed the demographics of airshow spectators as we as we move forward. And and obviously for the past 50 years, uh, ICAST has been around working to build um, the airshow industry. And and we're I, obviously our goal is to build a, a safe, professional and reliable um, entertainment option that, that helps uh, to continue the industry, uh, hopefully for, for many, many years to come. Well, we can't talk about air shows and the history of air shows without talking about some of the most notable performers that we've had at air shows. So let's talk about some of those great people that really were the foundation of the industry. Uh, uh, thanks, Nancy. A lot of these people have uh, been inducted into the 
ICAST Foundation Airshow Hall of Fame, including Bessie Coleman. Bessie flew in the 20s and 30s after World War I. Uh, she, was, she was one of the first women, and she was the first uh, black woman to fly air shows. Uh, I, 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 didn't, I didn't write down the date. I, I believe she was inducted into our Foundation Hall of Fame about 10 years ago. Um, another person was Art Scholl. Art Scholl uh, flew in the 70s and 80s. Excuse me, Bob Hoover. Uh, Bob Bob is as close as our business has to a household name. He uh, he flew in World War II. Uh, he was captured by the Germans. He was in a German POW camp. He escaped from that German POW camp, stole a German Focke-Wulf 190 fighter, uh, and flew it to freedom in Holland uh, near the end of World War II. When he got back, he became a test pilot. And when he wasn't uh, when he wasn't working as a test pilot, he he started to fly air shows in in all sorts of different airplanes. Uh, as a as a test pilot for North American, he flew the F one hundred, the F eighty six. He he had a probably one of his best known acts was in a P fifty one Mustang that he called Old Yeller. And, and as I said, he was probably the most, the closest thing we have to a household name. We lost Bob two or three years ago um, at the ripe age of, I want to say, 92, though I, I don't remember that exactly. Um, it, just a great ambassador for aviation, a skilled and popular airshow pilot, and, and, and probably, as I said, the most famous airshow pilot ever. Um, Art Scholl uh, flew in the 1970s and 80s. He flew a uh, de Havilland Chipmunk that had been outfitted with a stronger engine, more powerful engine, and he developed a reputation for being especially entertaining. He had a, a showmanship flair that uh, built him a reputation for more straight-line aerobatics as opposed to warbird aerobatics. He, he was one of the first to get a, a sponsor. Um, on, on a full-time basis. And he, he, in addition to running a flight school in California, he was one of our first full-time 365 day a year airshow pilots. Uh, today we have a, an award named after him called the Art Scholl Showmanship Award. And as um, strong and well-known of and entertaining a pilot as Art Scholl was, the people who have subsequently won the award named after him is really like a who's who of air show performers. But we had a bunch of other ones. Uh, Charlie Hillard flew with the, the Red e the, the, the Eagles, first the Red Devils and then subsequently the Eagles for 25 years. And uh, he was one of the first uh, parachutists to do a baton exchange in midair during a free fall. Uh, also just an amazing showman uh, that had a, had a reputation both with the Eagles and as a solo pilot. Uh, for most of his adult life. Betty Skelton was the female aerobatic champion in the early 50s, and she went on to have a very successful uh, airshow career before becoming a race car driver, if you can believe that. Lincoln Beachy was more of a Wright Brothers era pilot. He flew uh, a late model Wright Brothers flyer uh, in the between, I, I want to say, 1911 to 1915. He did the first outside loop. Uh, he, he was literally the first pilot to have a full-time sponsor. And in his day, which is the, the beginning of aviation, really, back in the, in the uh, teens of, of the last century, he was a celebrity really like no other pilot since. He, he drew, routinely drew crowds over 100,000 and made the kind of wages, salary, uh, fees, that pilots today can only dream of, uh, air show pilots today can only dream about. He was a celebrity, a, an air show celebrity. So uh, that's, that is the foundation, uh, both the early days and subsequent of, of our business. And you can find more about the people who helped to, to, to get started in this business and create this business uh, at the ICAST Foundation Air Show Hall of Fame website. It has, I believe we're up to about 70 Hall of Fame members now, and all of them have made contributions of one kind or another. They're not all performers. We have some event organizers and stunt stunt people in there as well. But they were. Uh, but but it is it is the best of the best in our business and the people who made the business that we we know today. 
You know, Adam, you alluded to air show safety and, and that evolved as those early air shows began. So I think that's an important thing to talk about that ICAST has a major role in is show safety. So what are some of the major contributions that ICAST has made through the years when it comes to show safety? Yeah, absolutely. We, uh, John will talk about a little bit about industry standards um, in a minute, but um, some of the main things, some of the biggest things, especially if you've ever been to an air show or participated from a, from a performer standpoint or from the back end standpoint of an air show, um, the air show briefing uh, is absolutely key and essential. Um, it's one of the things that is the, it's pretty much you do it. There's no questions asked. It's the same idea if you're flying formation, you always, you always brief, you brief the flight. I mean, that's, it's just a, you're, it, you're going to do it. But the reason for the briefing um, is to uh, pretty much deconflict uh, and and create a plan uh, for everybody to follow um, for each and every every air show day. Uh, so essentially, every every show day, including practice days, um, begins with a with an air show briefing. Uh, you go through the possible safety issues um, that are that are surrounding the the specific uh, place that you're flying, whether it be on a, over an airport. Uh, whether it be a remote show over water, over land, somewhere else, that's that there's no runway below you. Um, but it, it doesn't matter. You, you start with the briefing. Um, beyond the safety issues, uh, you plan the flight operations. You work through uh, the specifics of, of the actual uh, run through of the show, the, the run of show and, and where, uh, where people are flying, who you're flying after, what happens if the person in front of you, they, they, have a mechanical they can't fly where do you go what do you do etc et um so there's there's all the specifics of that so you basically you get rid of all the questions um beforehand in a room um that's dedicated just to that uh specific effort uh and then obviously you set the common ground rules uh amongst all the key players which whether they be pilots um any ground crew members uh crash fire rescue um the air boss announcers any show organizers, et cetera. So everybody, everybody is on the same page. And that's kind of the key of, from a safety aspect that everybody knows what's going on and understands what's going on um, so that there aren't any surprises. Because even though an air show may be very fun and entertaining and there may be fun things going on, um, everything in the show is, is well planned out, well thought out, um, and is not a surprise to the organizers and to the, the people who are actually doing it. Um, and actually making it happen, uh, but it can be a surprise to the audience because that's that's part of the uniqueness and part of the the fun novelty of of what air shows can bring. Um, so, John, if you want to talk about some industry standards, yeah, I, I think I think when you talk about uh, safety and standards in the business, it's it's important to point out that our safety record here in the United States and Canada, with the spectators who attend air shows is almost unblemished since 1952. In 1952, there was a, a horrible accident in uh, Colorado that killed uh, seven or eight people. An airplane actually departing from the show, not, not during the show, uh, lost power and crashed into uh, the spectator area and, and seven people, I, I'm pretty sure it was seven people were killed. Uh, after that, uh, our industry went to the CAA, which was the precursor to the FAA. So this was 1953, 1952, even before the FAA existed, and said, we want to help you develop standards. And, and the basic model of airshow safety that was developed then is the one that we still live by. And it's part of the reason spectators are so safe at airshows in the United States and Canada. We have... Uh, uh, agreed upon setback distances depending on the speed, weight, and power of the airplanes that are flying. Uh, we prohibit aerobatic energy of the airplane to be pointed at the crowd. So you'll, if you've been to an air show, you know that when an airplane is upside down or rolling, uh, there's a strict prohibition on it being pointed at the audience so that if the pilot loses control or has a mechanical problem, the plane would not continue into the audience. Uh, we, we, as uh, Adam mentioned earlier, we have a, a very rigorous program that we call the Aerobi Aerobatic Competency Evaluation Program. Every pilot every year is subject to an evaluation by one of his peers. The FAA used to run this program up until 1992, but they didn't have the expertise and they were approving people to fly at air shows who were really not qualified and they had a horrific uh, 
uh, safety record, not with the spectators who were who were protected, but with the pilots. So they gave that to us uh, almost 30 years ago, and the the accident rate in our business business immediately plummeted. Um, for the spectators, in addition to a prohibition on aerobatic energy at the crowd, a strict uh, evaluation program and the separation distances from the audience, we also have what we call the sterile aerobatic box. So uh, if you can envision a transparent box that's dropped, a rectangular uh, uh, kind of box that's dropped over the entire area of the air show up to an altitude sometimes of 10 or 12,000 feet, nobody can be in that um, space, not just in the uh, in an airplane, but on the ground either, so that in the event of an accident, nobody on the ground gets hurt. So that's that's the basic uh, premise of the air show industry, and we've we've tinkered with that and refined that. Um, we we know that as strong as the safety record with spectators has been, uh, any at any moment at any show in any year that we could we could have an accident. So we're very uh, together with the FAA and the people who work in our business. We're very careful. Um, to self-monitor, uh, uh, we we subject uh, or we we submit ourselves willingly to most FAA and Transport Canada uh, direction on safety issues, and um, and we we run this ACE program. Uh, along the way, we've picked up we've in some cases recommended things to the FAA on how to improve safety, and we have at least in my experience a pretty unique. Re- relationship with the regulators, both in the United States and Canada, where it's more of a partnership than a a combative or contentious kind of thing. Obviously, they sometimes do things that we disagree with. We sometimes do things that they disagree with. But by and large, it's been a very effective partnership. Uh, And over the years, that has increased professionalism. We had a guy um, say to us one time, uh, informal conversation, that safety is for sissies. And I kind of cock my head and look at him funny. And I said, I, I don't really think I understand that or agree with that. And he said, well, if you're professional, if you go about your business in a professional way, if you prepare, if you brief, as Adam explained, if you, if you, if you develop a sequence that always gives you a way to get out if there's a problem, then you're being professional. And if you're professional, safety will take care of itself. And that I can, I can agree with. And I think that is sort of the standard by which we uh, measure a lot of a lot of what we do with an ICAST. Excellent. Okay, well, let's talk about air shows. How many air shows take place in North America annually or even worldwide? Do you guys know the numbers? Worldwide is hard to get at. Even in the United States and Canada, it's hard to get at. Um, it, it It is slightly down from what it was 20 years ago. Uh, 20 years ago, we probably had in the order of 350 to 375 a year. Uh, these days, it's probably a little under, a little over 300, depending on the year. Uh, that includes, of course, uh, big air shows at Oshkosh and and Dallas, uh, Houston, and and Miramar, and, and those kind of very visible, very large shows. But also the country shows. I was lucky enough um, uh, earlier this year, during the pandemic, actually in in early July to go to a small grass airfield uh, about an hour and a half south of here in Virginia, uh, where I live, to a a place called the Bealton Flying Circus. Uh, That was the first show of Bealton's 50th anniversary year. They have shows, 90-minute shows, every Sunday afternoon from er mid-May or so to uh, mid-October. And they've been doing that for 50 years, if you can believe it. And, And so for every... Oshkosh or or Midland or Houston, there are 20 of those shows. And not all of them are ICAST members. Some of them are so small that we can't even find them. And the FAA doesn't have really a centralized way of telling us where they issue waivers. So uh, between 290 and a, in a, in a bad year, well, not, not this year, but in a typical year, a light year might be the 275, 290 and, and up above 300. And they look. Uh, I see that you've 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 uh, put up an aerial photograph of what looks to me to probably be a military show somewhere. And that is, that it, there's nothing typical about any air show. They all have their own character and and uh, and setup. But this is this is fairly close. A, a large number of statics. Uh, the parking at this show uh, is very convenient. You can see the flight line where the where the people are um, are gathered, and then out out 
to the to the upper left is is the beginning of the aerobatic box where the performers would would perform and again there's nothing typical but this this looks something like what we typically see at uh, dozens of air shows this of course would be on the large size maybe even on the very large size depending what time of day this picture was taken uh, and and I think one of the strengths of our business is that uh, when I went to that show in in Southern Virginia that I mentioned a few minutes ago I asked how many people are here today and they said between 500 and 600 500 and 600 at twenty dollars a ticket um, 20 times a year for 50 years uh, it, some people would turn their nose up at, at a crowd size like 500, but I think it truly is one of the strengths. It was Stearman's, it, I think there was a T6, a Chipmunk, uh, some Aerobatics Act, uh, wing walking, some very, what, what others might consider corny kind of things, uh, uh, chasing helium balloons and cutting them with the propeller, that kind of stuff. Um, but our business runs the gamut from that all the way to the Paris air shows and, and, and those kinds of things with uh, hundred million dollar jets performing in front of the public for the first time and, and, uh, and everything in between. So I, I think that's part of the strength of our business and part of why it has survived uh, 110 years now, uh, a, a very unique form of entertainment that even in any given year, you, you sort of have a wide range of air shows that you can go to. Yeah, and I bet in every one of those communities, you know, that's an important part of their culture and, uh, you know, that that's an important part of their business as well. You know, I, I think about um, poor Oshkosh and what that's like this year with, with no show there and how many families were depending upon that money. And, uh, and the show you mentioned in a small community, I'm sure that's a big part of their culture. So uh, it, it's great to see that. So, um, any must-see or favorite air shows that you guys have? Well, obviously, you have to start in Dallas, Texas, and Houston, Texas. Those are the uh, those are the standards for air shows, especially Warbird air shows. Um, uh, but but I but we neither Adam nor I could get away with singling out the CAF shows with uh, we'll get in trouble with all our other members. And anyway, I went into this a little bit, Oshkosh, uh, Sun and Fun, Miramar, Chicago, uh, Seattle, uh, New York. We, ha we have some enormous shows. Uh, there pr there's probably n not as many people at those shows as the promoters would, would have you think, but certainly in, in some cases in the hundreds of thousands. Um, but one of my favorite shows is a small show in Torquio, Missouri. Uh, Congressman Sam Graves serves that um, district in the United States House of Representatives. And uh, I don't know, maybe 15 or 20 years ago, he, he had a small air show. He invited some of his local friends. And uh, uh, as, his, as his group of friends expanded into the, to the national aviation community, a lot of them came to Torquio. It's a uh, Adam might know the place better than me. I'd say it's a four or five thousand foot um, small runway, uh, pa paved runway, um, and uh, uh, there's certainly not more than a thousand people at, at that show. But it has a character and uh, 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 its own fan base and its own way of doing things that I think are pretty, all, all very safely, of course, and within the guidelines set by the FAA and our organization, but but a lot of individual character on its on its own. Um, so uh, now it's your turn to be put on the spot, Adam. What what do you think is your favorite show? I had a I thought about this a little bit. I mean, you had kind of mentioned some of the big shows are. I mean, from traveling around the country and actually being assisting some performers and such. I've I've, I've seen my fair share of shows and. Some of the bigger ones are always fun. I mean, like the the New York shows and the Seattle shows where you just, I mean, it's just expanses of people and, and masses, and it's just fun to see the the excitement for those shows. But I would say just as much of, of fun with the big shows, some of the small shows are, are, are just as enjoyable, if not more so sometimes, because you get to get a little more up and close with, with some of the people. And pre-COVID days and, and really kind of get to know who's there and why they're there and what they're, what they're up to. And it's their, it's just like air shows have always been. It's the moment where you can come into a, a small town and, and show them something that they've never seen before or something that they only see once every two, three, five years. Cause some of these small shows 
just they they can't do an every year deal and so they do every few years and and that that ends up working out pretty well um i think it's it's just been fun to it's it's just kind of fun to go to different shows in different places and and kind of experience different things and i know some people specifically travel uh to shows each year just because they want to add to their bucket list of sorts and so that's kind of it, it's just neat to see um from that standpoint but i don't know that i've ever met a bad show um i've certainly met shows where it's just 120 degrees and and ridiculously hot um but beyond that it's uh each each one is unique um and certainly enjoyable excellent well, when we talk about air shows, we really also need to talk about the um, trailblazers that we have, because I know there's there's a lot of people who have made a difference and, and really led the way. So can you speak to some of the trailblazers that you've encountered along the way? Yeah, this is uh, this picture is uh, Nicole Fifi Malinowski when she was a major. I, I believe she finished her career as a colonel. She was the first uh, flying member of either of the United States military jet teams. She she flew in the number three position for the Thunderbirds, oh, I, I would say maybe 10 or 12 years ago, uh, and, and uh, went on to have an amazing career at, uh, as a uh, White House fellow, as a uh, squadron commander, and, and just checked a lot of the boxes that had not been checked by women in the past. And I know I, I I knew her somewhat when she was on the team, though we've lost touch since. And I but I know that during her time on the team, she she was an inspiration to to young girls and women of all kinds uh, to 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 blaze that kind of trail to 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 find herself uh, at the very top of the top in a in a profession, in, a, in a, a niche position on a military jet team that had for so many years been occupied only by men. Um, she didn't have to brag about that. Uh, the, the, the little girls, young women, uh, even uh, older women, uh, they knew what they were looking at and they knew what that meant for for women of all, females of all kind. Uh, since then, the Thunderbirds have had several uh, uh, female pilots. The Blue Angels had a, a C-130 uh, female pilot, a Marine Corps captain, if I remember right. Um, the S Canadian Snowbirds have had several women, uh, I believe, and including the team lead uh, some years ago. So that that's that's one thing. That's that's one of the uh, uh, trails that have been blazed um, in our business. Uh, we talked earlier about Bessie Coleman becoming the first uh, female black. Uh, aerobatic pilot, and uh, and that that's been exciting. Um, the 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 military, and especially the military's interface with air shows, is as I said earlier, a place where people are inspired either to start a career in aviation, join the military, uh, or just do whatever they do better than they've done it before. The the the, the level of commitment, the expertise, the the skill that they demonstrate routinely at an air show, uh, uh, they don't even have to try to be inspirational. It just kind of naturally happens that way. Um, one other, I, I believe it's the next slide. One other thing that I think is important about air shows is, uh, is, is the idea that, um, that, that, that we're growing. And I, I, actually, I'd, I think I'd probably throw it to, um, to Adam here to talk about the future of air shows a bit. All right. Um, well, we we're let, I mean, the, the, from from a standpoint, we still think the future is bright, and we we actually we absolutely believe the future of air shows is bright. Um, obviously, in this COVID world right now, uh, we're we're doing what we can to have air shows, and air shows are happening. Um, we've had a few now thus far. Uh, most of them have been drive-in air shows, uh, so they've basically been a pull your car in, park it, and you sit outside your car in a lawn chair and watch it just like you're at a drive-in movie theater. Uh, and, and those have actually been quite successful, the ones that, that, had have, that have happened. Um, there was a show in Texas uh, just back in, in July um, that was over a lake. Um, so essentially people were socially distanced being on boats um, on the lake, which actually seemed to work out quite well as well. Um, there are a few more shows uh, throughout the rest of this year of 2020 
that are scheduled. Uh, most of them are drive-in shows uh, across the country. Uh, so that's, I mean, very, very positive outlook to see um, going forward into 2021. And we'll we'll talk about this in a little bit with with the convention. Uh, it's the outlook is very promising, uh, especially from a standpoint of people haven't had it have haven't had the opportunity to get together at an enter entertainment option basically since the beginning of this year and people are itching and scratching to get out and be out and and go see these uh see something and do something um with their community in a, obviously in a safe way and air shows provide them that outlet and and honestly air shows are a a, a relatively safe um, from that standpoint, I'll let to be in because they are outdoors. And so that helps to mitigate some of the uh, requirements that that are surrounding uh, what we're currently dealing with. But looking forward into that, um, we've had many of the shows uh, that have had to cancel this year because of COVID uh, are are doubling down and saying we are we are absolutely bringing our show back next year. And we're going to do everything we can to be stronger and better than ever. And so Overall, the future of air shows is very bright and very strong. Um, John, if you have any comments on that uh, from a standpoint, yeah. but I, I think I, I, I'm very excited about it. I, I'll jump in with the drive-in air shows, especially. It's a little counterintuitive uh, when you think about a drive-in theater to see that in an air show situation might might seem like it's unappealing. But we've already had enough shows to demonstrate that that's a pretty effective way of having air shows during the pandemic. And uh, if, it, if it's not obvious from that, that, uh, that two word description, people, sh uh, families typically, or, or groups of people who uh, are familiar with one another come in to the air show, they're given their own 20 by 20 spot to park the car. They can stay in the car, they can get out of the scar car. They're expected not to go there. It doesn't have statics like a traditional air show would have. It's got minimal concessions and people are not expected to roam around. They're expected to stay in that area. There's obviously accommodations for toilets and that sort of thing, but they come in in their car, they stay in that area and then they get in and leave. And we've had some both overseas and here in the United States, uh, we've had some successful examples of that. We've got a big one coming uh, at the end of this week in, in Canada. Um, uh, and so the, the short term future of air shows uh, looks pretty good. Uh, it, it's tough time for any kind of mass attendance event, obviously, but our the creativity of our members and other airshow people around the world is starting to get through. And we're we're having as 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 Adam mentioned a show over Lake, uh, these very small shows that I talked to you about in Virginia. People are finding ways to to have the get their airshow fixed despite the problems. Um, looking beyond that, I th I think. Um, uh, we were in the middle of a major initiative to start supporting STEM and workforce development at air shows when the COVID pandemic hit. And uh, the idea at that time had been that uh, STEM is all the rage, of course. And what better hands-on laboratory than an air show? The, not just the pilots, but the mechanics and the air traffic controllers and, and, and the high technology on display. Uh, not just aviation technology, but all sorts of other technology. It, it really is a traveling laboratory that has been underutilized, frankly, by industry and educators to s sort of introduce children and young adults to the idea of STEM. Uh, within the aviation industry, uh, again, before the pandemic, but this will become a problem again once we're through this. There was a horrible pilot shortage. There's a horrible air traffic controller, maintainer, uh, uh, dispatchers, aviation generally was was looking at a very serious manpower problem as soon as a couple of years from now. So this, the pandemic will change that. But by the end of, by the middle of ne the next decade, uh, this will be behind us and we'll, we'll have these problems facing us, potentially even worse because a lot of the people who fill the roles, particularly in the airlines, will be retiring by that point. So we see in the not too distant future, air shows being a, a, a really uh, logical and positive way to impact workforce development issues. Uh, the economic issues of air shows are also interesting. Uh, we do, periodically we do economic impact studies of air shows. 
uh, Nancy, you mentioned this early in the conversation, when a big air show or, or a small air show in some cases comes to a community, that's a, that's a significant impact. That brings money like any other event, a concert or a, or a circus or something like that. They, it brings money from outside the community into the community. It gives the community something to, to, to be proud of and to get behind. It supports almost every air show in the country. In fact, I would go so far as to say every air show in the country benefits multiple charities and philanthropies in the form of outright contributions or the opportunity for volunteers to generate uh, a cash uh, a cash fee to their organization, Boy Scouts, Rotary, that kind of thing. Um, it would be inappropriate, uh, especially with this crowd, not to talk about just what it means to have warbirds in the air. Um, I alluded to the fact that that was what drove my interest as a young boy, and I've never really lost it. Uh, the 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 plastic uh, uh, composite aircraft uh, that have been built in the last few years and and are capable of doing amazing aerobatics that shouldn't be possible in an airplane are very interesting to me. Uh, uh, some of my best friends are aerobatic pilots. But the thing that really gets me juiced up is to see a, a carefully maintained or restored World War II warbird, that, like, like the airplanes that uh, CAF has, has become so same, famous for. And there, when you think about it, there's really no other place to do it. I was in um, Massachusetts uh, seeing my, my, uh, my adult children last weekend, and we went to a small aviation museum um, up there. And I, I love aviation museums, but it's just not the same seeing some of those planes in a museum as it is to see them out there flying, whether it's simple racetrack patterns or aerobatics. It, 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 planes were meant to fly, and, and it's better to have them in a museum than not at all. But uh, I have a lot of respect, not just for CAF, but all the other uh, aviation museums that maintain their aircraft and fly them either generally or, or especially at air shows. Uh, so all that stuff, all that stuff is what the future of air shows are and uh, and a lot more that, frankly, we haven't even anticipated yet. This this pandemic has us down uh, as an industry, but our guys are fighting like heck. And um, and as as Adam said, when the p pandemic is over and people are kind of hesitantly trying to figure out what they can and can't do, uh, uh, a rock concert or any kind of concert in an enclosed stadium or 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 indoor concert venue will almost certainly make some people nervous. A big ramp at an airport with lots of room to uh, to uh, separate yourself and and a and a hopefully uh, on on the right day a nice breeze blowing right down the runway. That that's the kind of thing that even nervous people in a post pandemic environment can feel comfortable with. And so. Our members are looking for a very big 2021 season. And then by 2022, I, I hope all this will be behind us and we can get back on the path that we were setting in 2018 and 2019 and get away from all this. I look forward to that. And I absolutely love the innovation that I've seen within the industry. The idea of a, a drive-in air show is, is just great. You know, it, yeah. it's a, a way to still connect with the audience, make people feel normal again. They need it. They love it. They've got a chance to interact with their family. So it's a super idea. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Well, let's talk about the annual ICAST convention, because this is a big deal. And if our audience has not attended this, they are missing out on something great. So tell us about the ICAST convention in beautiful Las Vegas. So each year, uh, and as, we, as John talked about early on, each year we hold, uh, right now we hold the ICAST convention in Las Vegas at the Paris uh, Hotel. Um, and uh, previous years, it's been any, anywhere from Nashville to, I believe it was in Disney World. Uh, it's, I mean, it's, it's been all over the place, but we've pretty much settled on um, mm -hmm. Las Vegas as a, it's just a, it's a great place to, it's easy to get to. Um, and we've kind of built some really good relationships there to help, uh, help us help the industry overall uh, going forward. Uh, usually held in the first or second week of December. Um, 
the uh, the the convention is essentially the the place where planning for the upcoming season happens. And actually, a, a wonderful thing that's happened in the last few years is that people are not just booking shows and 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 planning shows for the following season. They're planning shows for two years, three years out. And so that that effect has is, has really helped the industry overall to build and to grow um, and, and to give the opportunity for uh, just absolute exponential growth. Now, obviously 2020 has been a very difficult year. So 2021 is, is a very important year um, for ICAST in general, but for the convention as well, because it's the time where everybody's gonna come together uh, and share those ideas and those things that we've learned thus far um, and, and work together to build the industry going forward and what air shows look like uh, going into the end of this pandemic and, and back into um, the normal world again. So that, that's, a, that's a key point of, of why this, this convention is important because it's, it is that, that gathering and that, that ability to, to work together and to share that knowledge uh, that we've talked about multiple times on, on helping this industry to continue to grow and to heal and, to, uh, can, and build again. Uh, like John said earlier, uh, usually in a normal year, we see anywhere from 1,500 to 1,600 uh, attendees at the convention. Um, this year we'll be down just slightly, but it, it, we hope to kind of be back to those, those, those levels again very soon. Um, beyond that, John, do you have anything to say, uh, convention wise? Yeah. Um, one, one quick thing. So we want to leave at least a couple minutes for questions, but, um, CAF is a huge part of our convention. They sponsor the convention. They have, they send, uh, um, uh, Nancy, you may know exact numbers better than me, but it, it is it is at least a couple, three dozen CAF members come to to book shows, to to book acts for their own shows, to learn more, to interact, to interface, to uh, to 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 figure out better ways of doing things. And uh, I I don't know what the terms or or conditions are for CAF member to go to the convention. We as, we certainly welcome you uh, as as a CAF member. And I'm sure you can contact somebody within CAF headquarters if you're interested in attending to figure out how to do that. It's it's a in addition to being a great learning opportunity, it it is it is very special when 1,500 people with that same passion for air shows gather in one place. And uh, it you know I, this would this will be my 24th ICAST convention. We're of course like like uh, CAF people are busy at their air show. We're very busy at our convention, but it is nonetheless my favorite week of the year. It's a chance to see all the people we work with all year in one place at one time. And I think um, if you're, you don't even have to be involved in the air show business. If you're interested in aviation and interested in air shows, it's a, it's a great place to be. Yeah. And as you mentioned, you know, the, the opportunity to gather and, and the knowledge that's shared in a formal session is, is really invaluable for anybody as a, in a trade show. But just like any trade show, the opportunity to interact informally with your peers is as valuable, if not more so, than some of those formal sessions. And, and you get an awful lot out of that. And certainly it's a great way to celebrate the end of the year as well as to launch the new year and look forward to what's next. Yeah, well said, Nancy. Exactly right. Well, let's open this up for the audience to ask some questions. You know, we've got the website here and some information on how they can learn more about ICAST, but I know that Leah Block, our vice president of, of uh, marketing, is behind the scenes screening questions. So, Leah, can you jump in here with some questions? Because I know the audience has been rolling in with things. And as usual, you know, the texts start flying on my phone, too, as, as there's people that have questions. So, Leah, this one, this is on you. Jump in. So, we have a lot of questions, and I'm really excited. And looking at the attendees, we, we really have so many familiar names, but a lot of names that, that, you know, I don't recognize offhand. So, within the audience, we've got probably the, you know, brain trust of air shows from performers to directors to everything in between. So, that's pretty cool. Um, one question that we had was, is there a print publication that ICAST offers? Yes, we publish a quarterly magazine called Air Shows, and uh, that goes out four times a year. 
for the second and third quarters of this year, we have opted to send that digital only as a cost cutting uh, measure, but we will publish again with our fourth quarter and thereafter. If you uh, are a member of ICAS or if you have attended the ICAS convention uh, as part of uh, a, a contingent from an ICAS member organization, you get that automatically. And if you want it and you are neither a member uh, nor uh, an attendee at the convention, uh, you can contact us Contact us at ICAST headquarters and we can make arrangements. Uh, it's I, I don't remember the subscription fee. It's like $25 a year or something like that. Thank you very much. And um, by the way, we always do this after the, um, the webinar is over and we have a video. We email everybody. So if there's questions like that, where to, to click and join in publications, we'll make sure and put that in a follow-up email so that you guys can access it that way. Um, so here's a, an interest, a comment from Jim says that Mr. Hoover was 94 when he died on October 25th, 2016. Um, the question that came up is, what type of person becomes an air show performer? Um, you know, it, it just seems like such an interesting profession. So what, what does it take personality-wise and, and logistically to become an air show performer? Adam has worked in the business, so I, I, I think I'll give that one to Adam. It honestly, it takes uh, it takes vision, um, and it takes just an absolute unquenchable thirst to achieve a goal. Um, and it, it, there's the people that I've met in the industry, um, as far as the ones that have been very successful. Just they one day decided they wanted to do that's what they wanted to do, and they they contacted. Um, people and they talk to people and they put it out there and they put it on the line and said, Hey, this is what I want to do. And they, they slowly work their way up now from a, just a specific, uh, specifics, uh, essentially you would, you would need to obviously learn how to fly and, and get from the standpoint of, of doing that into understanding and learning aerobatics and, and then getting actually, uh, accredited and getting your, your card and, getting approved to fly in different um, different altitudes and doing aerobatics and such uh, before you could actually fly at air shows. Uh, just from a standpoint of, of just being an air show performer, I honestly, I've seen pretty much anyone, uh, they've come from all different backgrounds uh, to, be, to, to get to that point. So there's really not a, uh, hey, if you're in this world, then you have you have the opportunity to do it. Or hey, if you've never been to an airport before, there's not a chance you're never going to be a pilot, or you're never going to fly in air shows, et cetera. So it really just takes the drive and the determination uh, to do it and to get there. Yeah, w w one one more word about that: uh, the drive, especially. It, it is a hard business. It can be a hard business for a performer. So if you're sort of wishy washy about whether you want to do it, it's probably not a good thing for you. The people I know, and, and uh, uh, Adam said this, but they are pretty passionate about what they're doing. So um, this is a comment and a question. It says, with the social distance being a norm now um, and live streaming happening with, um, you know, with pilots and flyovers across the country, that there's been a larger international audience that's gotten engaged in aviation, which is a small positive from COVID-19. But the question is, is there going to be any um, industry emphasis on doing more virtual shows and virtual presentations of air shows? Uh, you know, it's funny. Uh, this is probably true of every industry, but some of the workarounds and temporary fixes will remain permanent. Um, I, I, we, we talked about drive-in air shows, which I know is not what the question was about, but I, I think in some communities that will become a permanent fixture. Uh, and, and there was a virtual show as recently as this past weekend in Toronto. Um, to me personally, it doesn't scratch the same itch, but I would rather see a virtual air show than no air show at all. And when we, when we got involved, I, I want to say it was late April, I think, in something we called the socially distant air show. Uh, it, I was amazed to see the international involvement and the high, we, we ended up that, that, uh, that socially distant air show on Facebook has now close to a million people have watched it. And you don't, despite what an event organizer might say, there's no air show in the country that gets a million people. So it is a way to reach out uh, 
and, and, and be an ambassador for aviation uh, beyond that which comes to the airshow community. And, and for sure, we have learned some things about uh, holding and promoting uh, virtual air shows that I think will um, will continue after the pandemic. It, it it's 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 a logical way to increase the size of our footprint, get people interested enough to maybe come to an actual show later on. So yes, is the answer. So this is an interesting. I I've not thought of this, but it makes sense. With advances in 5G Wi-Fi and virtual reality headsets, can ICAST see a future for the spectator to sit in the cockpit and ride along? I, I'll, I'm guessing John's going to say he doesn't have the technical knowledge to potentially handle that question, but I would say absolutely um, that's a possibility. I mean, if you look at where we've come in the past five, ten years as far as uh, just the ability to have live cameras in the cockpit um, and to stream that live to the world, uh, being able to put on a VR headset and actually just put yourself in that cockpit is probably not too far off. And I think we're, we're pretty, pretty close to having some pr amazing advances in that realm. And I would be surprised to see things like that and other, other things that we haven't even dreamt of yet, um, really making a difference and, and giving people the opportunity to get one step closer, whether or not it be virtually or for real, to uh, that aviation um, portion of, of what air shows give, give people. Two, two or three years ago, uh, somebody put the first 360 degree camera um, in an in a aerobatic plane and then I think also in a Blue Angels plane. And that to me was mind blowing to, to go through a portion of an air show performer sequence, being able to move the camera as the viewer, not the operator of the camera, to see 360 degrees, all all axes around the airplane. That that, that was pretty spectacular. And and I do not have the technical expertise, but I'm I'm guessing that uh, coupling that kind of camera technology with the with the virtual reality stuff is not so far away. I don't have the technical expertise either, but it sounds awesome. So I hope that somebody can jump on that one <laughs> pretty soon. Um, the next question is, do you see the future of air shows incorporating unmanned drones? Um, just talking about how the military is advancing in that area, do you see air shows getting in the new uh, military technology as well? I would say yes. I mean, from that standpoint, they already have uh, at the, I believe it was the Nellis show last year. Um, they, they flew a predator drone in the show. Um, I think it just flew by, uh, but and it did a couple of passes. But from that standpoint, the military utilizes air shows um, as a, as a great place to, to show off their technology and, and what, what they can do and what, what you can do for the military and you can do with the military. And so to see some of their unmanned drones and any other technology they come up with, um, whether it be the next fighter or bomber, or et cetera, uh, I, I wouldn't be surprised to see those flying in air shows or flying uh, as, as a public demonstration of, of what they can do and, and what their abilities are. The, the other thing, Leah, is that, uh, um, and we've talked about this, about this with the FAA, um, air shows have, as I explained earlier, a big block of sterile airspace. They always have an FAA monitor nearby. And the, the drone industry is going to want to increase their public awareness and education. Drones are going to become a bigger and bigger part of what we do. And, and they are already hungry to help the public be less afraid of and more informed about drones. So military or civilian drones, we are at a regulatory hurdle right now. Um, it, it's too complicated to go into, but right this instant, there are some there are some problems related to regul uh, uh, certification of aircraft. Basically, who can perform in front of an audience? But that is a largely administrative uh, hurdle, not a not a safety or performance hurdle. So once we get past that, I expect you're going to see. Drone races, drone demonstrations, drone, drone. It's, you know, obviously you can do things with a drone that you can't do with an airplane. And and once we figure out a couple pieces of the puzzle, I think it's going to be a bigger part of the air shows. And I think it'll make the air shows more entertaining than they have been as well. 
Okay, our last question here is, um, how do fans of air shows support air shows now? Is there anything they can do now to kind of, um, you know, support the people who are performing a lot of air shows will, are likely not to get sponsors as much as they used to also. So, so what can people do? Where can people go? Well, uh, uh, basic stuff, but still important. Um, if, when there is an air show in your community, go to it. Uh, even if, if, if you don't have the whole day, which is what we'd prefer, come out for an hour or so, demonstrate your support, remind yourself of why you like air shows in the first place. Um, but, but maybe more importantly is tell your neighbors and your friends and your family. Uh, I, I, uh, but at this point, everybody in my family and anybody who I could even remotely call a friend has heard way more about air shows than they'd like, but, um, but nothing makes me happier, uh, than, than bringing a newbie, um, to, uh, to, to an air show. We, we had, uh, my, my son was in college uh, three, four years ago and, and we ran into some people, uh, f some parents uh, 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 through that, and they, they didn't know us. They didn't know anything about air shows. There was an air show close to his college, and, and I made arrangements to have uh, a, kind of a, a, a nice experience for them and for us. And just to watch them take it all in, and the, the aerobatics, and the jets, and the noise, and the old airplanes, and the new airplanes, it, it, I, I get a kick out of watching it. And so if, if you love air shows, uh, anybody on this call or anybody ever watches this in the future, uh, don't, don't keep it a secret to yourself. Share it with your friends and your family. It, it, it's, it's safe. It's, it's inexpensive. It's entertaining. It's, it's different. Uh, and uh, and I, you know, I'm trying to think if I've ever brought somebody to an air show where they say, well, that was a miserable experience and I'll never come back. I don't, I don't think there's been one and I don't expect there will be because it's, you know, if, if they if they care enough to say yes in the first place, they're going to have a good time. There's almost no question about, it. you know, absent rain or something like that. But uh, uh, go to an air show and bring people with you or or help make it easy for them to go if you can't go with them. Uh, and that, that's that's what our business needs. It's 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 frightening to me and, and an opportunity for us. How many people in the, in the general public don't even know about air shows, uh, a, a very big percentage, like two thirds of the country doesn't know what an air show is or why they might want to go. And that's a, that's something that ICAS has to tackle, uh, but you can help us um, by, by letting your friends and family know. And absolutely, uh, kind of pump, jumping off that real quick is, is, is telling people and utilizing social media is a, is a key component of, of telling that story. Um, and sharing that and whether it be a video a photo or just a what whatever story that you have um, There are so many uh, stories throughout the air show world and of people have had experiences and and being able to share those uh, As widely and, and broadly as possible is is what makes uh, air shows get more um, face time essentially and helps people to understand. Oh, this is actually going on This is something that I can participate in and it, and it gets it gets them to that air show and then ultimately gets them hooked and, and you, you just kind of build the audience from there. And I think there's, there's so many opportunities for inspiration within air shows that uh, you absolutely want as many people as possible to experience it. Good question. All right, Leah, I think you said that was the last question we had coming in from our audience. So I'm going to jump in here unless you've got another one. Uh, I'm going to recommend to our audience that, first of all, you go look at the ICAST website. On there is a list of all the shows and the updates, which ones are canceled, where the drive-in shows are. It, it's a great resource for where is your local air show or, you know, make it into a little little road trip and go find an air show in your area and go have fun. Take your family, take a friend and enjoy it. So support ICAST support the air show industry. And if you like what we're doing with these webinars, please consider supporting the Commemorative Air Force as well. Adam, John, it's been such a pleasure today. Thank you for sharing all about air shows with us. I can't wait till the next one. Uh, I hope that's happening soon in our area. And if not, it's, it's worth uh, jumping in the car and going to find one. So I, I look forward to seeing you guys at a show and certainly at the upcoming convention in Vegas uh, in just a few months from now. Yep. 
Thanks, Nancy. Thanks for having us. Thanks, Nancy. My pleasure. Thank you.